Kishe Roach's teacher uh, is is ill, and there's a ceremony tomorrow in New Jersey. Um, most of the older students know about it already, but there have been some questions about what to bring. Uh, so for those of you who know what I'm talking about, uh, it's at 2 o'clock. You do not need to bring anything, any practice materials or any prayers. Uh, everything will be provided there for you. Janice, go ahead. should bring it. Okay, so you should bring your tundra and your sadhana. Take it back. Um, and uh, as far as uh, the ceremony, the purpose of the ceremony is to offer prayers for Rinpoche, uh, for his health, and to ask him to continue to stay and to teach us, and uh, to try to help clear any obstacles to his health. And it's good to bring some kind of offering. Flowers are very appropriate. Uh, if you'd like to bring a little envelope with something precious in it to, uh, to give to him, you can do that. Um, and I think that's about it. Hi. Uh, I'd like to start with meditation. So take about five minutes and uh, just try to get your mind off your day and into this room, okay? So we'll take about five minutes of silent meditation.
Do a short prayer and something. What is that? Mandala <laughs> before class. Okay. If you know it, uh, say it. If you don't know it, then just think some good thoughts as we as we offer it.
tonight and, and to, can you hear me okay? Yeah, okay. This is sort of a new place for us, so we got to get used to it. Uh, tonight we're going to cover uh, Offering of the Mandala, um, and then two more Friday nights. I think, are they consecutive? No. Okay. Next Friday also. Okay, and then skip a Friday? And then the next Friday after that. So uh, we have three Friday nights to cover uh, Offering the Mandala. Um, I like to use a lot of Tibetan. I think it puts a seed in your mind for learning Tibetan. There are a lot of people in this room now who thought they would never learn Tibetan and who have gotten quite good in Tibetan. Uh, some are translating. In fact, there are maybe nine or ten people translating now. And uh, so it's not impossible that you might end up like that. So I'll make Tibetan noises, and you have to try to repeat them loud. This space is a little harder to fill uh, than the other space, so you have to be a little louder <coughs> than uh, at the other space. Okay. Uh, first, I'll give you the Tibetan word for mandala. Say kinkor. 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 Okay. Uh, those of you who are linguists, uh, an exception to the second column, that's pretty rule, prenasal. Okay. Say kinkor. Kinkor. Okay. Kinkor is the Tibetan word for mandala. I'd like first to talk about the word itself, and then I like to spend a little time and tell you uh, where this stuff is coming from. Like, I'm going to show you how the tradition came down to us. Uh, so first I'll talk about the word kinkor. Um, the explanation I'm about to give is from Tsongkhapa's commentary to the Guya Samaja Tantra, okay? which I can't teach you that. Uh, but that explanation has come into the Lam Rim teachings. It's in Namdo Lakta, uh, Liberation in Our Hands. And uh, it's also in Ken Rinpoche's uh, commentary on the mandala. So it's out of the realm of secrecy, so I can teach it to you. Okay? Uh, Kiel stands for Say Ningbo. 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 Can you see that okay? I don't mind to make it closer. Somebody want to help me? case means lemba. Say lemba. Lemba. Um, and Jetson Kappa explains that this part is the manda part, and this is the la part, or lati, uh, Sanskrit. Um, and that's how you get mandala. Okay, mandala. Uh, manda refers to nyingbo, or essence, and la, in this case, refers to lemba, which means to take. So the word kinkor, the Tibetan word for mandala, means to take the essence. To take the essence. The essence in this case is the, is the state of mind of an enlightened being. The state of mind of an enlightened being. And it's a little hard to describe, but basically uh, a person who at any given moment perceives 
every existing object in the universe that ever was, that is now, and ever will be. In, in one instant, that person uh, called a Buddha can see every existing object that ever will be, ever was, and is now in the universe. Okay? Uh, so we distinguish between Buddhas being omniscient and Buddhas being omnipotent. Uh, omniscient meaning a Buddha can see everything, every detail of the universe at this moment. For example, can see everything we're thinking right now. Every thing that every person in this room is thinking right now can see them. Uh, is not omnipotent, okay? Did not make the world, uh, cannot take away cancer, for example, from a person, uh, doesn't have power over a person getting old or dying or things like that. So I'm um, not omnipotent, but omniscient. So this nimbo, here the word essence, refers to the state of mind of an enlightened being. Lemba, in this case, is close to the word gur in Sanskrit, which means, in Tibetan, zimba, which means to hold, to hold the wisdom of the Buddha, to hold the state of mind of the Buddha. And that's what a mandala does. A mandala is the expression of the state of mind of an enlightened being. So a mandala is the, is in this case, in the mandala we're going to talk about, is the physical representation of an enlightened state of mind. It holds the essence. It takes the essence. It has the essence of an enlightened state of mind. And so a mandala, when you talk about a mandala, is, is that. Okay. It is the expression, physical expression, of an enlightened being's mind. Okay. And that's what kinkor means in Tibetan. Um, kinkor in Tibetan can also mean a disc. And it's, we're going we're gonna to see more about that later. But a disc shape you know, like a three-dimensional disc shape, is called a mandala in Sanskrit and also in Tibetan. A kinkor can refer to any kind of disc, disc shape, disc shaped object. That's a kinkor also. Um, next I'm going to talk a little bit about where all this, I'm going to teach for three nights on mandala. I've never done it before in public. I don't know if three nights is enough, but we're going to try. Okay. But I want you to know where it's coming from. Okay, so I'm going to trace a little bit about the lineage of this teaching. Mm -hmm. The earliest places in Buddhism in this world, in this planet, uh, is a sutra called Tsekpa means to build. Uh, I don't know why this sutra is called this. Uh, but this is uh, a very short sutra. It's found in the, in the canon as it exists now. In other words, we do have a Tibetan translation of this sutra. And in this sutra, sutra means uh, a teaching given by an enlightened being, a teaching given by this Buddha in this case, uh, something taught by an enlightened being. So in this sutra, which is dated from 500 BC, uh, the Buddha describes the offering of the mandala, how to do it, and the benefits of offering the mandala. And it's sort of a cool uh, reference. Uh, in, in that reference, the Buddha says, you should uh, prepare uh, models, square, round, or they call it uh, the shape of a wooden horse, which means a, a cart. And in in India, a cart, if you've ever been there, like a bullock cart, is, uh, is shaped like this. Uh, with a little bit of a, not quite a triangle, like this kind of a shape, and then a, a, a cut off nose like that. And it says, make, your, make constructs of that shape. Uh, they often mention, uh, fill them with flowers, flower petals and then offer them to the Buddha. And as a result, the karmic result, is that you will become, uh, you, will, you will gain mastery over the four continents of the world. We're gonna talk about Buddhist geography later today. Uh, but 
in Buddhist geography, there are four great continents that make up uh, the world, and there are eight subcontinents. And the four great continents happen to have those shapes that are mentioned in this sutra. One is round, one is square, one is shaped like this. And, uh, and the Buddha is, uh, he's pretty obviously referring to offering the world to your lama, okay? Offering the world to your spiritual teacher. And he's describing in that sutra, offering ob uh, objects of these, these sort of uh, constructs or images of these shapes, say made out of wood, filling them up with uh, flower petals and offering them to your lama. So this is the very, uh, one of the very early sources. You also see mentioned uh, the sutra of Avalokiteshvara, <coughs> and uh, you see other sutras mentioned as well. This is the one that's most found throughout the, the tenure, the co early commentaries from India. Um, then you have a, an important book called Chupa means 50 verses, 50 verses about lamas. Uh, this is a very early text from maybe 200, 300 AD. And uh, it's a tantric text. Uh, it's, a, it's a secret book about how to relate to your lama properly. Uh, I can't uh, go into it because it's secret. Uh, but if you are doing tundru, and you have that commitment, uh, and if you have the commitments that are tied to doing Tundu, then you have to do a thing called Lama Ngapju Kaptan Gyawai Bomba Mangyang Tsushin Sung. You have to be following this, the rules of this text. And one of the rules uh, involves uh, offering uh, mandalas made of flower petals a certain amount of times a day to a certain being. Uh, and you're supposed to be doing that. Uh, so this is another early source for the offering of the mandala. Mm -hmm. And that's, if you're going to keep those commitments, you have to know them, and you have to know how to offer a mandala. Okay. That's a, another source. Um, we're going to also use uh, the Lamrim Chamo. Say Lamrim, Chemo, Lamrim, Chemo. This is by a, a great Tibetan uh, Lama named Jetson Kappa. Dates? Okay. Um, teacher of the first Dalai Lama, greatest, uh, <coughs> greatest master that Tibet ever ever produced. Aside from my teacher, but, uh, something like that. Okay. Uh, we're going to rely heavily on his great book on the stages of the path, which is called Lamrim Chimu. Okay, great book on the stages of the path to enlightenment. And finally, uh, we're going to use a book called The Sea of Bliss, which was written by. A lama named Quicksilver, who lived. <laughs> <laughs> His other name is Dhammabhadra. Say Dhamma. Dhamma. Badra. Dhamma Badra. Very important uh, lama in the lineage of the present Dalai Lama and his teacher, and his teacher's teacher, Pamokuru Maché, 
uh, one of the very important lamas of that, of that tradition called Muju. And we're going to follow his text mostly. We're going to be mainly following his text. Um, he wrote a commentary on a special kind of mandala offering, which we are going to study. There are countless mandala offerings that you can do. Uh, we're going to go through many of the divisions of the mandala offerings, but the main one, which is now being used in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, uh, is, is called the 37 heaps, which comes from piling 37 little piles of grain. And that's the one that, that we mostly use in our tradition. And he has written a commentary on that. He has written a very nice explanation of that. It's never been translated into English, but one of the students here is working on it. Uh, it was supposed to be ready for you the first third tonight, and due to my own uh, <coughs> busyness, it wasn't done on time. So all you got was the 37 pile, 37 part <coughs> mandala text, uh, but you'll get the commentary starting next week. Okay? That's fresh off the presses. It's being translated by Scott Brown, who's a student here, and he's doing a really nice job. Uh, we wanted to throw in the uh, Tibetan, but it sort of take us a little bit longer to finish it. But we'll have that ready for you next time. Um, so I wanted you to know that, that the explanation I'm about to give uh, comes from tradition. And uh, I'm also going to use a commentary which was given uh, by my own uh, Lama, Kenra Pichay and Geshe Bosan Tachi. Uh, and he, he gave a very nice... Uh, small commentary, which has uh, been printed by Snowland some years ago. Okay. So with that, we'll go into the different types of mandalas. Uh, Quicksilver gives the following types. Say chi, nang, sama, dekonani. Chi, nang, sama, dekonani. There are four, basically four types of mandalas, and these are the four types. Okay. Chi means outer, outer mandala, okay? outside mandala. And this is the kind of mandala where you are offering to your lama uh, the world. Okay, in the shape of a, a little plate with some grain on it, and we'll talk more about that. But this is the, the offering of the mandala as, as you most commonly see it. And you are making this offering to your, to your lama. Yeah. Nang means inner, inner mandala. And it's, the, it's an offering of the mandala, uh, offering of the world or the universe, using the parts of your own body as the mandala. So different parts of your body represent the different parts of the universe. And that's called an inner mandala. Uh, some of those are secret, some of them are not. Uh, so we, we'll talk a little bit about the ones that aren't. All right. uh, the ones that are secret are sort of super secret. And you, you really have to have uh, not only an initiation, but you have to have permission to get that teaching after you have initiation. So that we won't do in this class. Uh, say Sama. Sama. Sama means secret. Uh, those are all the mandalas that everyone prints on the calendars and hands out. <laughs> uh, secret mandalas uh, refer to secret worlds, uh, secret places uh, of, of certain secret beings, and, uh, and we won't be going into them. Uh, say dekona, dekona ni. ni. Dekona ni. Dekona ni. Uh, dekona ni means uh, suchness, which is a synonym for emptiness. And we'll talk a little bit about that, but not too much. But this is basically where um, 
you offer the world to your lama, the universe to your lama, uh, constructing it out of emptiness, okay, using emptiness as the raw material, and then offering a representation of the, of the world to your lama. Okay. We'll talk very briefly about that. But we're going to concentrate on the uh, Chi Madal. Don't be disappointed. It's very amazing. Uh, you have to learn it. You have to start from the beginning. You know, you can't go straight to uh, the, the, the more esoteric mandalas. You have to start, uh, it's required that you start with the chi mandala. Uh, if someone got up here and took you straight to the other mandalas, it, you, it would not be, uh, A, it wouldn't be proper, and B, it wouldn't work. Uh, nothing, you, you wouldn't learn about that mandala because that person would be breaking a certain code of secrecy. So, and then it would not, it wouldn't be an offering of mandala. You wouldn't be learning the secret mandala because it's not secret. Uh, secret means something you learn privately from your lama, uh, secretly. And, uh, and the details of that you, you have to learn after you learn how to do the other kinds of mandalas. So we're going to start properly and necessarily uh, with the outer mandala, okay? which is chi mandala. There are a lot of different versions of this mandala, and they talk about, uh, mainly they are given their name from how many little piles of stuff do you have to do to make this mandala. Uh, very stupidly, I did not bring a mandala plate with me tonight. Uh, anybody have one? Somebody says, I think Tsongkhapa, says that uh, there's a thing that monks have to carry around called a delpong. Delpang means when you become a monk, they give you a little Buddha image. And uh, you have to keep it for the rest of your life on your, on your <coughs> person. You, know, you can never be separated from it. Uh, which is why I carry around this stupid briefcase. Uh, <laughs> and I just got hassled in Beijing for that. They found it and they questioned me. They interrogated me you know, you know, in, at the airport but you can never be separated from it. So I didn't know what to do with it, so I tried to hide it, but it didn't work. Uh, anyway, they say that, that you should treat your mandala plate like that. You know, I think it's Jetson Kapla who says that your mandala plate and your delpong should have the same status. In other words, you should always be carrying around your mandala plate. I don't happen to have mine with me. Uh, <laughs> but now I think I have to get another one. By the way, they're very hard to get. I mean, mandala plates, nice ones, are very hard to get. And uh, we're, we're trying to arrange for some. I haven't been able to yet, but we're going to try to find some in Kathmandu or something. Maybe we'll have some here by the end. But right, so far, I haven't been able to get. They're very hard to find. They're very hard to get right now. So maybe we have to produce them. I don't know. What are they made we'll, of? We'll talk about it. She wants to know what they're made of. We're going to get to them. So anyway, the names of mandalas are, are given from how many little piles of grain do you, do you use when you build the mandala? Uh, there's a five-pile mandala, uh, there's a nine-pile mandala, there's a 23-pile mandala, there's a 25-pile mandala, there's a 37-pile mandala. Okay. Um, the main two that are current in our tradition are the 23 and the 37. The 23 was the favorite of Jetson Kappa. Jetson Kappa used the 23, and when you do your normal mandala offering, like Sashi, Pugi, Joshi, Mentola, you are doing the 23 in a very abbreviated version. Uh, when you do your extensive mandala offering, which is what you have in your text here, uh, you are doing the 37. And maybe someone who's artistic could, could make a, a diagram as we go. I haven't made one, but I appreciate if someone, if anyone's particularly artistic, they could, there's a certain order to the piles and a certain meaning to each one. It'd be nice if someone could uh, record it. Uh, what I like about Quicksilver's commentary is that he, he actually explains where to put each one and what they mean. And I always wonder, you know, I've been doing it for 20 years and I never caught one <coughs> straight. So uh, he, he does get it straight. So you're going to be studying the 37th pile mandala. Uh, this mandala, in the, in the text it says Drogon Pakpa. Say Drogon, Drogon, Pakpa. Drogon, Drogon, Pakpa. Uh, this was the system of Drogon Pakpa. Uh, as far as I can figure out, Drogon Pakpa is the Pakpa uh, who was the nephew of the Sakya Pandita. 
Saki Pandita lived around the, in the 1200s. Uh, he was the greatest master of Buddhism in Tibet in those days. Um, and there's a very uh, cute story that, uh, like, Kubla, what's his name? Genghis Khan, Chinggis Khan, had come to the borders of Tibet and uh, informed the Tibetans that if they would like to give him a tribute, he'd appreciate it, and if not, he would wipe out the country. <laughs> so, uh, so they decided to give him a tribute. And, and they escaped the fate of a lot of other nations. I mean, Genghis Khan and his troops uh, reached, they took Korea, Vietnam, China, all the way down into India, down into the Middle East, took Moscow, and reached uh, Vienna. In one day, uh, in the outskirts of Vienna, they killed 400,000 Austrian troops. Uh, and we would all be speaking Mongolian, <laughs> except that the Khan died. It took three years to get the message to the front lines. The, the supply lines were three years long. Uh, and three years later, they got the word, and they were just about to enter Vienna, and they turned around and went home, uh, and never came back. The Khan died, and his grandson named Godan Khan uh, was, was in charge of the area around Tibet, and the Tibetans stopped paying the tribute. So Godan Khan went to the border of Amdo and said, uh, sent a message to the Sakyapanita and said, uh, I want to learn Buddhism. Uh, I heard you're the greatest Buddhist master in Tibet. And uh, if you are, I'm a sentient being, and if you're compassionate towards all sentient beings, then you should teach me Buddhism. And if you don't, I'll wipe out all the monasteries in Amdo. <laughs> 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 so we still have this letter. The letter still exists. And uh, so Sakyatara decided to go see him. And uh, he was very old at the time. And he started off, and people kept stopping him to teach in the villages on the way. So as a, as a show of good faith, he sent ahead his two <coughs> nephews. Uh, and they were just teenagers. And they got to the Mongolian general's camp, you know, like weeks before the uncle did. And one of them was named Pakpa. He was very persuasive. He described Buddhism to Godan Khan. And before Sakyapanita reached there, uh, Godan Khan had already pretty much been educated into Buddhism and already accepted Buddhism. Uh, ever since those days, the Mongolians have been Buddhists. And they have a great Buddhist culture, which they're just now reviving in Mongolia. Very exciting revival going on there. Really wonderful. I was there last week, and uh, incredible things going on. Um, so that's Pakba. Uh, became the Lama for the Mongolian emperors of China. And he became the Lama of Kublai Khan. And when Marco Polo reached China, he met Pakpa uh, in the court of Kublai Khan. So it's kind of neat. Uh, Pakpa is the person who invented or who, who promulgated the mandala offering, which you're going to learn. Uh, he passed away in 1280. So that gives you a date of when the 37 pile uh, mandala offering was started. So you're really learning a custom which goes back uh, to good days, okay. <laughs> back to Papa's time. Uh, Papa also invented the Mongolian alphabet, gave the Mongolians an alphabet. So he's a great, great lover. Okay, so we're going to go now into the 37 uh, pile mandala. Mm -hmm. I'm going to talk more about the, you know, the the what do you call them? The mechanics of making the offering, and then uh, towards the end of the class, we'll get into the to the real deep meaning of it. Okay? But right now, I just want you to f understand uh, roughly the symbolism of it. Okay. So, uh, Muju Quicksilver says, first of all, you should start out with a plate. It should look like a a pie plate, and. Uh, you should turn it upside down like that. You know, it's like, you know, like that. And uh, I don't know if you've ever seen those little, those little dishes that Indians use to take their lunch to work. They don't use a lunch box. They use these little dishes. They're about this wide, and uh, they're about this high. They look like little pie dishes. And in fact, my llama, when he was looking for a mandala plate for me, couldn't find one. And in desperation, last day, he was in India like 20 years ago, brought me back one of these Indian pie plates. And I've been using it ever since. Uh, so that's fine. You can use an Indian pie plate or whatever you can get. Um, the text says it should be about a troop. 
Uh, one text says it should be about a true. A true is, I think, 24 sores. A sore is a, a, a knuckle width. So a true is a one, two, three, four, five, six. This is a true from here to here. Okay. True she makes a dome. Uh, 500 domes make a young top. And uh, monks should stay 500 domes from the nearest possible lay person. That's how we're trying to get our tax exempt in Connecticut. Uh, anyway. That's a true. So it should be about a cubit. Ideally, it should be a cubit. I've never seen, really, anyone use one that big. Uh, there's one out in New Jersey about that big. But basically, uh, we normally we use them about this big. You know. Usually it's about, I don't know, 8, 10 inches, something like that, across. Uh, and that's, that's the plate. Mm, the plate, they say, if you have the mula, uh, sh you should make the plate out of as precious a substance as you can afford. And it's not being, uh, it's not like being show-offy or something like that, but it's just that you should offer to your lama the, the most beautiful thing you can afford. So if you can afford it, gold or silver is best. Okay? Uh, if you can't afford that, uh, they say, uh, Car, which means kind of a white metal, like a bell metal, or bronze or copper for this plate. And they say if you can't afford that, you could use uh, like an Indian lunchbox plate <laughs> or, uh, <laughs> or something made out of wood or something made out of ceramic. They say if you're a meditator in a cave out somewhere on the west coast or something and you have absolutely nothing else, you can use a uh, piece of slate, like a piece of stone. Uh, should be circular. Ideally, it should have a like a, a face on it, like that. Okay. Um, you know, like an upside down frying pan. In fact, the text says a frying pan. So it should have that edge on it, a rim on it, like a frying pan has. Okay, but you're going to be holding it upside down, right? Uh, and that's that's the material for the uh, plate. In the scriptures, I mean, ideally in the scriptures. Nowadays, people use the most common, I think, is copper or bronze. If you have the money, people get silver. I haven't seen a gold one, but I, I think they exist. Um, and you should, the plate should be like that. The stuff that you're going to use to pour onto it, nowadays people use rice or barley or wheat grains, mostly. Uh, the text says if you can afford it, you should use... Uh, Gold powder, silver powder, <laughs> uh, diamonds, rubies, emeralds, uh, jewels. You know, ideally, uh, small pieces of mother, what do you call mother of pearl, pearl, pearls. You know, something like that. Something really precious if you can afford it. Okay, uh, that's the ideal one. Uh, second quality is supposed to be some kind of uh, like, like what do you call it? frankincense, myrrh, like hmm. precious powders or precious, uh, you know, sweet-smelling precious stuff. Okay. And, and in the ancient text that I've seen, the most common material that's spread on the mandala is uh, flower petals. There seems to be some special significance, especially in the secret teachings to flowers. And uh, I think flowers are very appropriate. If you can do flower petals, uh, make the piles out of flower petals or something like that, it's very nice if you can do that. Um, and that's the basic plate. Now, what does it represent? Uh, basically, you're offering the world or the universe to your lama. And how do you get the world from a flat plate like that? Uh, to understand that, you have to understand how ancient Buddhism presented the world. There were two presentations on the world. One comes from the Abhidhamma. Uh, and then one comes from a teaching called the Kala Chakra. And those are the two. Uh, Abhidharma means like knowledge, uh, higher knowledge. And Kala Chakra is a secret teaching called the Wheel of Time. Uh, the mandala offering is, is usually made according to the presentation of the universe in the Abhidharma. Okay, especially the Abhidharma Kosha was written by Vasubandha around 350 AD. And in the third chapter, he gives the shape of the world and the measurements of the world. Okay, so we're going to do a little bit of Abhidharma geography. Uh, just so you can, this is the, the way you're supposed to visualize 
the mandala play as you make a mandala offering. You're, su you're supposed to have been doing this all those years. Okay? Uh, you're supposed to be visualizing the world like this uh, when you make this mandala offering. So you're holding that little plate in your hands, but here's what you're supposed to be visualizing. Okay? You start out with a, a king corn. Okay. This one's pretty big. Uh, in ancient geography, things are measured in yojana. can just about translate a yojana into about four and a half miles. Uh, so I've done all the calculations for you. Uh, this is this disc. This is what you're visualizing when you offer that little plate. Okay? Uh, this part here is seven million miles wide. Okay? From here to here, the, the thickness of this disk is 7 million miles. Right. I don't know what, how far is the sun, I don't know. Huh? You got a lot of opinions here. <laughs> 93 million miles. Okay. So, like one-tenth the way to the sun. Okay. 7 million miles wide. And uh, from here to here, you guys know a, a tongue may, right? What's a tongue may? A countless, which is really what? 10 to the 60th power times 4.5. OK, miles. OK, so when you do <laughs> Andy's having trouble visualizing that. <laughs> It goes a little bit past your skull. Okay. <laughs> um, this is called the Lungi Kinkor. Say Lung. Lungi. Lungi Kinkor. Lungi. Lungi Kinkor. What's Lungi? Wind. Lung means wind. Okay. And according to Abhidharma geography, uh, in the beginning of the universe, first there was nothing, and then there began this uh, wind this wind began to happen like a cyclone. Like this incredibly powerful cyclone started to whip up. And I don't know, you know, you could, maybe if you're a really good physicist, you could relate this to the formation of the universe as we understand it or as we explain it. And I don't think it would be so wrong to do that. Uh, I think it, when you study lung, meaning wind, in Buddhism, um, the deeper you study it, the more profound it becomes. The element called wind, or the energy called wind, uh, is underlies a lot of the world. Like a lot of the world, or the way things are made, or, or you know what we call atoms, or the, the energy behind atoms, uh, the, the energy be, be that acts as their foundation, and which, which, which is underlies all physical matter, including your body, most importantly your body. Your body has four elements in it, and wind is one of those elements. And uh, for example, medical treatment depends a lot on the knowledge of the elements. Um, I think the deeper you get into the idea of the four energies or the four elements, the more you'll appreciate the reality or the existence of a thing called wind. You know, they call it wind. They don't think, you know, there's some summer breeze blowing through your body or something like that. It's much more profound than that. There is an energy underlying the physical universe, and, and therefore part of your body also, called wind. And this wind energy is, is like a huge cyclone at the beginning of the universe. According to the Abhidharma, out of nothingness comes a very gently moving wind, and then it takes up speed, it gets harder and harder, until it is moving so fast that it's uh, harder than diamond. Okay? But it's, just, it's like a diamond hardness. And that wind is, is the underlying energy below on which the universe is founded. Okay. And that wind is this many miles wide and seven million miles thick. So, you know, there may or may not exist such a wind. There appears to be an important benefit to visualizing the universe this way. Okay? So I, I distinguish between, you know, is there or isn't there a wind that we could ever send up a satellite and find this uh, foundation of wind, or does it have a more profound meaning uh, in, in 
understanding the nature of the mind or understanding the nature of, of reality. And, and I would say it does have such a meaning, but you have to study it. Some of the people here have been through a course on Abhidharma geography, and we went on uh, to describe the different realms and the bardo and things like that. And all of this has relevance there. So anyway, when you do your mandala offering, and you have that little tiny 8-inch plate, please make it 4.5 times 10 to the 60 million miles wide, uh, and then 7 million miles thick. Uh, the color of this disc is blue. Okay, the traditional color of the element wind is blue. <laughs> At the center of the disc, we have a, a very small disc. Uh, and it's a long story how it gets there and all that, but I'm not going to go into it. Anyway, there are two parts to it. This disc is roughly. 11 million miles across. So if I drew it to fit the larger disk, I would have to, it would have to be a pinpoint or something, a smaller. Okay, but I'm just blowing it up for you. But when you actually do the offering, you try to imagine the universe, blue, disk, uh, huge, and then at the very center of it, an extremely tiny little disk of only 11 million miles across. Uh, oh, so cool. It has two parts. Uh, this part here is about 3.6 million miles thick. And that's some kind of cosmic water, okay? Like some kind of primeval water energy. When you visualize it, you visualize it as white. Okay, so in the visualization, this should be white. And on top of that is roughly 1.4 million mile thick plate of gold, okay? pure gold, metal, made of gold. So you have this huge, immense blue disc. On top of that, a tiny, tiny, tiny white disc. And the same size as the white disc, you have a, a disc of gold. At this point, uh, if you have that sheet that you got at the door, you might want to look at it. I want to tell you how your hands are. You know, you're visualizing this cosmos. Uh, but what are your hands doing? Okay. Uh, you should take your left hand and, and pick up a, a little bit of the grain. Okay, you, sh you shouldn't hold the disc with an empty uh, hand. Okay, so when as you're when you're ready to make the offering, and I'll do it next time when I'll bring my I don't know how I got separated from it, uh, <laughs> but you you pick up a little handful of the grain. You don't offer the mandala with an empty hand, and you you put some a little bit of grain in your left hand. And then you pick up the mandala plate with it. So you've got a little bit of grain in your, in your palm, and you're holding the, the mandala plate with your left hand. And then you take your, your right hand, and you pick up, again, some grain, and you sprinkle it on the top of the mandala plate. By the way, you're supposed to smear the inside of the plate, the bottom side and the inside of the, and the rim, with the five substances that come from a cow. Uh, they include milk and, and other things. <laughs> this was a custom in ancient India. It was considered very pure and made it very good. The top, you're supposed to smear with the five nectars, which I can't tell you about. And uh, also, you can use saffron water. So I think that would be appropriate. Uh, also, the stuff that you're going to offer, like the grain, you would normally, uh, you should soak it in saffron water, or some kind of uh, fragrant scent, and this would be a custom. So you're picking up some of that grain in your left hand, you put the plate in the left hand, and then you pick some grain up with the right hand, and you sprinkle it on the plate, and 
the first thing you do is you you rub the plate outwards like this, okay, uh, clockwise, and you are uh, in Rinpoche's commentary, he explains that uh, in the secret teachings, which I can't go into, uh, there's a close connection between the channels through which certain energies go through your body and your thoughts. So your thoughts, uh, your your thoughts in your mind, and and certain physical energies in your body are closely related in the secret teachings. Uh, so that there's a, something important about this particular part of your body, the, the right forearm and the, the lower part of the right forearm, there are some sort of uh, special sensitivity or the energies are traveling there which are related to compassion. Mm -hmm. okay. So there's something uh, to do with the energies here and the ability to develop ultimate forms of compassion. So it's important, you're stimulating this uh, skin, it is in turn affecting certain energies in your body, and those energies are affecting your mind. Okay. And that's one of the principles of the secret teaching. So, so you are rubbing this part of your forearm on the plate, and, and the first idea is that you're rubbing uh, clockwise, and you are getting rid of some bad energies. You know, you are cleaning off the plate like that, and you're spilling grain on it, and you're, 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 you're cleaning it in a circular motion with your forearm. And you're working out some bad energies. While you're doing it, uh, you should be thinking that you are clearing away certain kinds of bad energies. What does bad energy mean in Buddhism? Basically, obstacles in your own mind, spiritual obstacles, that were created by your own selfishness, uh, by your own uh, lack of compassion, by your competitive feelings towards other people, by all these uh, 84,000 diseases of the mind uh, that Buddhism teaches. But basically, uh, all the bad thoughts and all the, all the very uh, selfish thoughts of your heart, you, are, you have to imagine as you begin to make the offering that you are cleaning them away. So cleaning the mandala has a big meaning in your mind. You know, no text in Buddhism says that the mandala is anything more than a little piece of metal and you're sprinkling little useless pieces of rice on it. And if you think of it that way, you'll get that corresponding result. You know, which I'm afraid almost all of us who do this offering on a normal basis before class, you know, uh, that you're getting that result of, of thinking that it's just a bunch of fingers and some boring thing that you have to say before class. Um, you can't think like that. In the mandala offering, your mind has to be in a sacred state of mind. Uh, this is not uh, a little piece of uh, Indian lunch box plate. And uh, maybe that's why he gave it to me, I don't know. I've been trying to figure it out all this year. And you're sprinkling uh, rice on it. It's not bad. This is the wind on which the universe lies. This is the energy that, that is the foundation of the entire cosmos. You know, and you are uh, purifying it with your arm. You know, you are, you are purifying all the obscurations. What does obscuration mean is that, this is the idea of a dipa. There are two kinds of dippas, nyundip and shidyup. But basically, if you didn't have those, you could be seeing all the objects in the universe right now as well. Like your mind has the capacity. And given the chance, your mind can see it. Uh, and much more amazing things as well. But there are certain mental obstacles, spiritual obstacles. You have to think you are clearing them away. They are mostly created by your selfishness, by our selfishness, and by your, by your, by your bad thoughts that you feel about other people. So you are, you are cleaning that away. That's the first act of offering a mandala. Uh, after a couple of times around like that, then sprinkle some more grain on it, and then you you do the opposite way, counterclockwise. Okay, and you rub that same part of your arm on the plate, and you imagine that you are getting the blessings of all the enlightened beings of, the, of this universe. You know, you're about to offer the universe, and you are swiping, wiping, all their uh, knowledge and all their good deeds. You know, you are, you're like Dalai Lama's good deeds, you know, Rinpoche's good deeds, you know, you can rip off all of them. And uh, it's called a special kind of virtue, it's called yira. 
and, and you are rejoicing in their goodness, and you're thinking about their goodness. You know, any holy being that you ever heard about doesn't have to be Buddhist. You know? All the activities of any holy being, Mother Teresa, Jesus, Moses, whatever you want, uh, all their goodness, according to the Prajnaparamita scriptures, are the activity of the Buddha. They are Sangye Kichinme. So you can, you can enjoy all of them. So as you're offering the mandala, this is even before you start, right? You, 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 are, you are like, they call it gupa in Tibetan. You are hooking all this goodness and bringing it into you. Okay? And, and you, are, you are collecting all that goodness. You are cleaning off the plate like that. So that's what you have to be thinking uh, as you offer the plate. Okay? The very, as, as, you, as you start the, the offering. Then the umze says, What's an umze? Umze means a chanting master. Okay, normally the chanting master says he gives the first, he or she gives the first line of the uh, mandala offering, which is? Yeah, okay, say om, vajra, bhumi, a, a, hu, om, om, vajra, bhumi, a, a, hu. Okay, om. Om is a very difficult word to describe, uh, but it's made of the up of the sounds a, u, and u, um, and and contained in that one sound uh, are the physical characteristics, the verbal characteristics, and the mental characteristics of an enlightened being. Okay, so the way an enlightened being talks, the way an enlightened being acts, and the way an enlightened being thinks are all are all tied up in the word om. Okay? In the single word om is, is the way an enlightened being thinks, talks, and speaks. Uh, more specifically, especially, it represents the way an enlightened being acts, physically acts. You know, What kind of things do they do with their bodies? Those, that is tied up in the word om. Om is called a go, goyi. Goyi means uh, it often starts a holy mantra. Like the holy, holy words often start with the sound om. And this is representing the, the way an enlightened being would act. Okay, so it's called one of the three secrets. And it's also called one of the three diamonds. Okay, same thing. Secret and diamond in this case uh, means some kind of sound that represents the way that an enlightened being acts. And when you say that word, uh, it plants a seed in your own mind for acting that way. So, if you keep saying om enough times, uh, it'll affect your own mind and you start acting physically like an enlightened being. So that's why so many mantras and so many holy expressions start with om. Okay. Vajra means, uh, by the way, the way it's spelled there, Vajra, is the correct spelling. Okay. I mean the correct sound of it. Uh, Tibetan lamas have been accused of uh, mispronouncing Sanskrit and in some cases they apparently do. Uh, but the use of za <coughs> is correct. And uh, even in India today, like the word for king is radza. Okay, radza. And, and it's the correct pronunciation. I won't go into why, but if you study with a Sanskrit linguist in depth, you'll see. Uh, so anyway, vajra means diamond. Okay. Vajra stands for diamond. It's really like vajra. Okay. Vajra means diamond. Uh, bhumi. Bhumi means uh, earth, meaning uh, a big level place, like a level, or a bhumi. Bhumi means, uh, sometimes it can also refer to a spiritual level, like there are ten bodhisattva bhumis or levels. So in this case, it means a great, uh, the great foundation of the planet, which happens to be our planet, our universe, is resting on this, uh, on this gold disk right here. Okay. We're, the world as we know it is, is sitting on top of this gold disk, and we'll talk more about it. Uh, but in your mind, you're saying, Om Vajra Bhumi, Ah Hum. Um, the Ah is a, is a sacred sound that refers to the speech of an enlightened being. So when you say Ah, uh, you are planting a seed in your own mind stream to speak like an enlightened being. And when you say whom, uh, you are planting a seed in your mind to, to think like an enlightened being. So the om, the ah, and the whom represent the, 
the physical body of an enlightened being, the speech of an enlightened being, and then the way an enlightened being thinks. And when you say them as part of the mandala offering, uh, you are expressing the three, we call three seed syllables, sometimes called the three secrets or the three diamonds. And these are the, these are planting a power in your mind for the, for the, the, the actions, the speech, and the thoughts of an enlightened being. Okay? When you say Vajra, Om Vajra Bhumi, you're talking about the Vajra, the diamond, refers to the body, speech, and mind of an enlightened being. Okay? They're sometimes called the Dorje Sum, the three diamonds. Okay? And, and oftentimes they'll be visualized here, the body, speech, and mind of a Buddha. Okay? So you're, you're visualizing them here, and you're thinking of three diamonds, okay? three different diamonds. That's why you say Vajra. Also, Vajra means unbreakable, and as this disk of wind is often called Vajra, unbreakable. Okay? Bhumi means uh, that great foundation of the whole planet. Then you say in Tibetan, what? Om Vajra Bhumi of Bhum? Wan Chen? Okay. By the way, there's a certain rhythm to the mandala offering, and you know, you have to learn that from practice. But if you don't follow it, it sounds really weird to a Tibetan. Uh, so there's a certain rhythm that you should learn. And you should take the time to learn it. Uh, it's a very sweet rhythm. Uh, that's, that's a current lineage thing, that you do it that way. Uh, so Wang Chen Serki Sashi. Wang Chen means powerful. Wang Chen means great power. Ser means goal. And sashi refers to that foundation of the, of the world, meaning this gold plate right here, 1.4 million miles wide, 11, I'm sorry, thick, 11 million miles wide, resting on a water disc, resting on a, a disc of wind. Okay? And that's, that's what you're visualizing first. You're visualizing uh, an, a huge golden uh, disc, <laughs> mandala, uh, on which you're going to start to build up the entire planet uh, that you're going to offer to your love. Okay, so in your mind, when you say Om Bhadra Bhumi Ahum, you're, you're imagining this plate. And at this point, you should be sprinkling some, you sprinkle a little bit of, uh, of rice or whatever you happen to be using on the plate. By the way, the difference between the 23 piles and the 25 piles is whether you count these first two, but you're on the 37 piles, so you don't have to worry about that. Okay, so you say, Ombazu Bumi Ahum, Wan Chen Serki Sashi, and then you say what? Okay, we'll get to the Reiki after the break. So, take about a 10 minute break and then come back, and we'll get to the, to the Reiki, okay? Yeah, Okay, we'll start. We'll try to start. And next you have to do...